So to all those who are watching, welcome. Our session today will be on understanding food sovereignty and policy through a community lens, food systems in rural and indigenous Canada. And our presenters are Danielle Robinson and Stephen Penner. Danielle Robinson is a PhD candidate in the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development at the University of Guelph. She is currently studying the interrelationships between food sovereignty, rural tourism development, and cultural sustainability. She also teaches wine and food tourism and tourism planning and development at Okanagan College in British Columbia. Stephen Penner is also a PhD student at the University of Guelph, surrounded and supported by an incredible faculty in rural studies. His research and passion is exploring the enormous and complex power that lies in indigenous food systems, building an understanding of the nexus that exists in, a, in indigenous law, food sovereignty, and traditional stories, and how that understanding can facilitate a community-recognized food good life. He is also an instructor at the University of Manitoba in Native Studies, the University of Winnipeg in Indigenous Politics and Government, and also within the Masters of Development Practice, Indigenous Development Program in Business Planning in Indigenous Communities. I am now going to pass it on to our presenters, Danielle and Stephen. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you to people who are joining us today. Stephen and I briefly communicated in advance about how challenging it is to present virtually when you can't see your audience, but, but you definitely welcome them. So thank you for being here today with us for our webinar on understanding food sovereignty and policy through a community lens, food systems and rural and indigenous Canada. Uh, I'll be presenting the first part, but before I do, Stephen and I both wanted to make some acknowledgements. Uh, the first that applies to both of us, although our methodologies are different, is, is to acknowledge that the stories we're sharing in our webinar are possible only through the stories that have been shared with us, the gifts of Indigenous elders, knowledge keepers, and community members. And the second acknowledgement is to the RPLC, and in particular to Kathleen Cavani at Dalhousie, who guided the development of two policy working papers that Stephen and I worked on that are the basis for what will be speaking about today. So my section is organized to kind of take you through the history of the food sovereignty uh, movement, some of the contentious issues and challenges with regards to implementing something like food sovereignty into policy, and then the particular uh, context for rural communities in Canada. And then I'll be examining a particular policy and how that policy does or doesn't you know, fit with the principles of food sovereignty. So I'm definitely not uh, an expert in this. You know, as we said in our acknowledgements, we're really grateful to the stories and mine are predominantly from academic and great literature. Uh, there are people in Canada and organizations that have been working on these themes for a, a very long time and in my references and when the presentation is uploaded, you know, please refer to those for, for much greater depth of knowledge and expertise. But a brief overview for you. So this concept of food sovereignty as a movement, it, it emerged in response to the failure of current approaches to alleviating two challenges, global food insecurity and environmental degradation. And it's rooted in an uh, international peasants movement and La Via Campesina, founded in 1993, is an international organization that has been kind of at the center of, of that movement. They define food sovereignty as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, and their right to define their own food and agriculture system. And then the concept of food sovereignty that has been adopted in a wide cross section of movements outside of international peasants movements in Europe and in North America by non governmental organizations, including things like farmers organizations, indigenous rights organizations and environmental groups. Well, how do I advance this now. Hang on. There we go. Uh, so the principles of food sovereignty. So you can imagine that when you take a movement that's international and that's applied in so many different ways, uh, there's great diversity within it. But there are some key, some key principles that tend to be common throughout the food sovereignty movement. The first is 
food for people applied as this idea of the right to sufficient, healthy, culturally appropriate food, uh, and particular attention to people who are in situations where they're marginalized or hungry or under occupation. Uh, value for and to food producers, so really focused on the contributions and respecting the rights of people who produce food, who harvest it, who grow it, who process it, and, and rejecting any policies that threaten people's livelihoods. Protecting local food systems, so that's the focus on uh, the impact of local food through the relationships between providers and consumers and investing in, in local systems that have high quality and have healthy foods versus those that maybe are genetically modified or unhealthy or of poor quality. Uh, the principle of sharing best knowledge and skills and working with nature and supporting ecosystems. So things like agroecological production are not universal principles of food sovereignty, but very frequently are principles of food sovereignty because there's always a focus on environmental sustainability and working with ecosystems in ways that are uh, protecting the resiliency of those systems. So obviously, uh, uh, such a broad movement isn't without its, its contentious issues. And uh, one of those issues has been a uh, debate about distinctions between the concept of food security and the concept of food sovereignty. And that's been an area of uh, both political and scholarly discussion. But really both concepts are useful in understanding and, and debating food policies. And the way I would conceptualize it, food security, the right to healthy food, is a component of food sovereignty, but food sovereignty adds something to that or a few things to it because food security doesn't uh, treat the environmental conditions in which the food was produced and it doesn't deal with the issue of sovereignty about people's rights to be in control of their own food systems. So food sovereignty for me encompasses food security. Uh, early literature in food sovereignty tended not to be too critical, maybe a little bit idealistic and not particular attention to how practices might actually play out in policy. But more recently, there's a more critical examination of the origins of the movement and some of these conceptual and practical challenges of implementing a movement like food sovereignty in all of these diverse economic and political, ecological and cultural settings. So you kind of have a bit of a background of the history and the general principles, some of the contentions, then what does that mean for rural communities and food sovereignty? So although rural communities, again, are you know, diverse local growing conditions and environments and political and economic situations, agriculture is a uh, social economic foundation of many rural communities. And rural communities make significant contributions to Canadian national food sovereignty and they face numerous distinct challenges. So my part of the presentation is focused on rural agricultural communities that are not remote northern or indigenous. Uh, this is one of the ways Stephen and I were, were working on how we could kind of uh, consider these concepts and give things due attention, but also, you know, just because we've separated them here and we have it in our working uh, papers, we see them as very interconnected and we'll speak to some of those interconnections at the end, but I'm focusing mostly on, on rural agricultural communities and I'm referring here to Food Secure Canada uh, when we talk about how food sovereignty has evolved in Canada. Food Secure Canada has been working on these issues for many years and they have you know, a variety of policy related work and in particular discussion paper on food sovereignty in rural and remote communities that I would refer you to for uh, further information. Well, I wanted to start with contributions because I'm tired of, of deficits. I know they're there, but they're so, rural communities are important when you think about food sovereignty, not just because of the challenges that they face, but because of these extensive contributions, the centralness of rural communities to Canadian food sovereignty. Because this is where nutritious, affordable food for Canadians comes from. And these are the communities that are stewarding the national environment upon which sustainable food systems depend and making contributions to Canada's economy through their efforts. They're also the, often the, the starting point for connecting urban people with local sustainable food systems and, and organizations 
like the National Farmers Union of Canada, strategies like the 100 mile diet, farmers markets, slow food, alternate food networks, agri-food tours, and those things that connect rural and urban communities interested in alternative sources and varieties and cultures. It's the knowledge in the rural communities that, that leads the way in those areas. They're so significant. And at the same time, though, you know, rural communities do face uh, food sovereignty challenges. So, you know, in the first part, when I'm talking about those contributions, I'm talking about sovereignty at, at maybe the national level. And now when I talk about challenges, I'm talking about sovereignty at the community level. How do people uh, have the food they need or uh, control the processes in which the food is made and protect their environment within their own rural community? And there are challenges because policy and market forces undermine the ability of smaller local growers to sustainably produce food for local consumers. You know, industrial, large-scale food production businesses and prohibitive land costs, centralized infrastructure, all of those kinds of things make it difficult for smaller local producers to produce food for local people. And you, know, we, you see that when you study the trends, there are, farms are larger and there are fewer farmers but bigger farms so smaller local growers uh, struggle in current conditions and then for purchased food to buy nutritious store-bought food you have those rural challenges of higher poverty and expensive food increased distances to stores lack of transportation that, that make purchasing food more expensive as well so then you can imagine some of the challenges with institutionalizing food sovereignty and i you know, put in sovereignties there because that's one of the challenges in and of itself is which sovereignty are you talking about and all these multiple layers of of sovereignties nations and nations within nations and communities and individuals so it's very complicated and overlapping uh whitman identifies two main challenges to institutionalizing food sovereignty so that idea of taking this movement and putting it into policies or into official organized systems uh, since many, in many ways, the concept of sovereignty is people's right to govern themselves kind of runs counter as tension with a concept like institutionalization. So her, her two challenges are, how do you ensure that the food sovereignty principles are supported at pol by policy at different scales without compromising the foundational values of food sovereignty like democratic en engagement and connection to place? And the second one is, how do you institutionalized food sovereignty when the international trade system is set up to remove supports from domestic food and agriculture programs and you see that when you look at policy the you know the constant uh, pressure and incentivization of, of export agriculture that's kind of the that that's sitting beside the concept of food sovereignty with some tension so if those challenges aren't successfully met, the radical grassroots demands for food sovereignty could transition into institutionalized policies with compromises that, that basically aren't in keeping with the principles of food sovereignty. So if you look at the Canadian policy context, and here there's a link at the bottom there, it's um, you know, quite recent work doing a policy scan across Canada, looking at things like local food systems and food sovereignty, explicit consideration of the concept and its implications for the market and for the state are absent for most Canadian policy. It, that's particularly sensitive for rural, remote, Northern and indigenous communities because of these contributions and challenges. Uh, engagement with civil society and program evaluation and, and policy change isn't isn't typically leveraged. Evaluations tend to be top down or driven from an urban uh, technocratic type of approach or kind of siloed between departments. But that's not to say that there aren't positive examples, particularly provincial and regional ones or international policy initiatives where uh, policies are strengthening local sustainable food systems, uh, including promoting local food to consumers by stimulating demand, uh, food presence and increasing local food literacy, public procurement, uh, and opening access to regional markets by diversifying opportunities for focusing on small and medium-sized businesses. So there are a series of you know, a positive examples too of, of where policy does seem to be in keeping with, with food sovereignty. So because this isn't my area of expertise, and I was trying to tie these complicated big concepts of food sovereignty and then a huge concept 
agriculture policy and try to see how it would work in, in kind of some kind of applied way that would be also timely. I decided to look at the development of a food policy for Canada. So this is a, a federal initiative and there are many people working on this who, who know a lot more than me. So I'm going to refer you again to some websites where if this is an interest, I kind of direct you there. But it's, it's a process of developing a national food policy that will determine a long range vision for food related health, environmental, social and economic goals, and then also have some immediate action plans. And it's related to production, processing, distribution and consumption of food. It'll include numerous considerations related to food sustainability, food sovereignty, food security and food safety. And here's just kind of a bit of a timeline to provide you with uh, uh, context. So the mandate came from the Prime Minister in 2015. The consultation period on key themes happened throughout 2017. And the key themes were identified by this uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Standing Committee, increasing access to affordable, nutritious and safe food, improving health and food safety, conserving our soil, water and air, and growing more high quality food, which I just couldn't help but note in parentheses, kept transitioning as I was reading reports into economic growth, which I wasn't sure were automatically equivalent, but something else to kind of consider. Uh, and then uh, based on this consultation, the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Foods made a parliamentary report in late 2017. The government responded in the spring of 2018. Food Secure Canada gave a response to the government's response. And then in the summer of 2018, the government um, put forward a what we heard report that describes that consultation period. And then the food policy itself is expected later this year. So I'm not going to talk about the uh, static committee's reports or all of those responses, but definitely very interesting and many things that you could, uh, could discuss there. I'm going to just speak specifically to that what we heard report with a focus on the idea that democratization of decisions about agricultural policy and market integration are a condition of food sovereignty. So I really thought, okay, what part of this could I possibly speak to? I, I, want to speak to the process that policy development requires collaborative efforts and transparent processes driven by rural communities because they're so central to food sovereignty because of their unique contributions to national food sovereignty and because of the challenges they experience to their own food sovereignty. So I just kind of try to take one piece off to, to discuss today. So the what we heard report is available uh, online and when you see the presentation there's a link there and there's you know quite extensive um, consultation in a variety of different ways so you see there's an online survey with almost 45,000 responses a national food policy summit a series of regional engagement sessions uh, all in urban centers but one in in the north in Yellowknife uh, briefs to the House of Commons, over 100 written submissions, town halls hosted by members of parliament, community-led engagement by uh, non-government organizations, and then some self-led uh, national indigenous organizations also did consultation. So a variety of things. And then again, I'm going to narrow it down once more because there's so much you could, you could talk about here. And just look at the survey because in the What We Heard report, they do give you a breakdown of the percentage of respondents and the size of the community the respondents were from. And I thought that that was interesting because you see that the responses from remote or isolated communities is 4.2%. And the Canadian population living in areas of under 1,000 in 2011 census was 18.9%. And maybe it's more like 16.8 now, but it's not representative, like it's a quarter of the rural percentage of the population. So for me, I had, I had some questions about that in terms of seeing how critical rural communities are and then saying, oh, you know, who are you hearing from in your consultation process? So really it just brought up a lot of questions. Like what are the barriers to participation that exist in rural remote indigenous communities and how were they addressed by this food policy for Canada consultation process and who chose the process and who implemented the process and how did the process drive the outcomes 
because for me, those are really critical questions from a food sovereignty perspective when you're talking about democratic process. And there, and there are some, you know, pos really positive things or really, I think, sincere attempts to be uh, wanting to represent views from both urban and rural Canada. So if kind of, this is a, uh, you know, quote directly from that what we heard report and I've kind of highlighted some of the key points that maybe start to answer some of my questions uh, and maybe raise some other ones, you know, certainly uh, understanding that, uh, you know, the guidelines could be tailored for sessions to fit community needs and questions could be added, but there is a consultation toolkit provided and the themes of consultation have been pre-established. And, you know, there is an effort to, you know, that, that some local community members and understanding that are difficult to reach through traditional methods. So providing funding to Food Secure Canada to directly engage with civil society is a very, you know, positive acknowledgement. And you can go to Food Secure Canada to see the results of those in-person sessions. And then trying to provide opportunities for people to you know, submit their views through email or regular mail. So you, you see those efforts to work towards some kind of democratic process, although there are weaknesses. And so for me, then more questions about process, you know, should consultation demographics reflect the demographic reality, or perhaps even overemphasize rural remote and indigenous communities, given the great contributions and challenges, you know, maybe this is not a peripheral, like, sometimes we don't hear well from these people, we better, better go off and do some add on things, but really actually central driving this process, if it's going to be a policy that represents a food sovereignty for all Canadians. And then that critical question, which I applies to probably all consultation when policy is being developed, you know, when the input is wide ranging and broad based, not always consistent. And that's a quote again from the What We Heard report. How are decisions made about what input gets valued? And I don't know how you create the transparency in that process to understand it when you feel that some viewpoints maybe aren't getting valued in a consultation process. So really I'm leaving you just with more questions than, than answers. So my, my final slide for my part is really the key points of it for me that I could leave people with today is just that policy development processes that are gonna support food sovereignty for rural communities, they need to really genuinely afford opportunities to value rural participation in holistic, inclusive, transparent processes that bring together government and communities and open and critically consider the roles of the state and the market and food sovereignty. And that rural communities are uniquely positioned to contribute to conversations about profound structural changes. And there's really a need for action oriented community driven future research related to operationalizing and measuring concepts like food sovereignty. And then by way of passing it over to Stephen to note that that northern and remote indigenous food sovereignty is is in my mind, at the heart of rural food sovereignty, which is so central to food sovereignty for all Canadians. So with that, I'll pass you over to Stephen. Thank you, Danielle. Um, now we can see the difference between a PhD student and a PhD candidate. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I um, want to say bonjour, as my elder has, as many elders have taught me, I wanted to greet all my relations um, in a good way. Before I started, I wanted to do two acknowledgements, one similar to <clears throat> Danielle's, but I wanted to acknowledge that um, this webinar is taking place, or we're coming from Treaty One lands, home of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene people, and the homeland of the Metis Nations. Not something I do <clears throat> without a tremendous amount of, of heart and, uh, and uh, grounded in my, my philosophy of, of belief that we are, we are all beneficial, we're all treaty people and we all benefit from being on the land that was given to us or not even given to us, which was ceded to us by certain uh, indigenous peoples. I wanted to reiterate the teachings that I am sharing and it is that's my job is um, about the learnings that I learned, I've learned in going to communities through my research, through my journey um, and being gifted some knowledge and knowledge only exists if it's shared and sharing it is um, an honor and I can never reciprocate the gift that uh, of this knowledge, but I will try by um, talking. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Before I start, I will do my traditional introduction, which is um Mong and Dasnake, Mangan Makade Dodem, Winnipeg, Iwishti, Montreal, and Dunji. Father, son, teacher, learner, um, Wemstushki. I just what I just went through was my my spirit name, which is the Loon. Uh, my clan name, which is <clears throat> the Black Wolf Clan. Uh, my home which is many places, but my home is my adopted territory of Iwishti, which is Northern Quebec, James Bay Cree. I consider them family. Um, where I'm from and what I do with my life, and Wemstushki means I'm non-Indigenous. It means something else, but I will use a polite um, term. And everything that I'm going to say is as a discussion. It's not, these aren't my stories, as I've said, this is just a sharing. And my research work and way of walking is based on the Seven Grandfathers' teachings, which is not often associated with academia, but it's wisdom, love, respect, bravery, honesty, and um, respect and, and the truth. And these are some pictures because how can we have a conversation if you don't know who I am? I've got a little picture of me in black and white as a kid, my parents, which are very important. Um, and just some pictures of where I've been and where I've traveled. So my, my presentation is going to go through four things, understanding the role of amino pimatism in food policy, because I, I generally would like to refer to that as food sovereignty in community, good life, indigenous health markers in Canada, where we are now. It's data-driven, uh, making the case for community-based response within indigenous food systems, tell you some stories that I've been so gifted to see in my travels and give you a few policy recommendations that were shared. Not, these aren't my concepts. This is what communities have told me over and over and over again. So what should, what should a food policy? It should help strengthening voices and facilitating, facilitating unforgetting of indigenous food practice from the community's perspective, deeply based in the community's perspective. What is Mino Pimatuism? It's the Anishinaabe word for good life, but it's not just words. It's, it's very, very central to many um, indigenous peoples. This is just the Anishinaabe version of it or Anishinaabe representation. I, I gave you this one because it's by my favorite legal scholar, John Burroughs from the University of Victoria, who is in my mind one of the most um, eminent, preeminent Indigenous scholars around today. A more traditional or more elder version is what Mino Bimadwism, and you'll notice the different spellings, one's Cree, one's Anishinaabe, um, based on the prevention of illness, suffering, and maintaining of good relationships. This is fundamental to food good life in communities, and not just within Anishinaabe Cree, it's in Dakota, Lakota, Yupik, uh, in Nupiat, I can name off at least a 40 to 50 different indigenous nations where this is important in different forms. If we talk about the Arctic in Nunavut, it's known as Kwaiema Ya Tukangit, which is indigenous traditional knowledge, and it's based in Maligate, which is the concept of balance. This is may be new to some, may not be new to some, but it is very fundamental uh, part of their overall system of thinking and being. You can't pull away food from the economy, you can't pull the economy from health, and you can't be healthy and have good life if there's not one system that's working. And we know that in many communities, many systems aren't working. So this is something that in writing up the, the policy paper that Danielle, on my part, I sort of wanted to come up with a word that really brought to the core what, what is happening in many indigenous communities. They live in a food prison, not because of their own choices, but because of our colonial 
residential schools, um, 60 Scoop Indian Act, um, and it goes, it goes on and on. But it's not a food wasteland, it's a lifetime sentence to a food prison where they do not have authorship over their own foods because they don't have the knowledge existing in their communities because it doesn't exist anymore because it's been wiped out in many cases and is not um, fostered in many other cases. So food prison is a tough concept. It definitely would hold true in many communities. Sad to say. How should we explore indigenous food systems using the lens of indigenous perspective and worldview? I love this quote, stories are data with soul. Um, stories live with telling. If we're not telling stories and we don't treat them as, as hard data, we're not doing a service. This comes from a social scientist perspective. From my perspective, it may be hard for some people in the hard sciences to accept, but I think the paradigm is changing and more people are taking on indigenous research methodology as real and authentic. Some are not, some are. As Mother Earth of, as mother of life, Mother Earth gives birth to everything, food, the water, the medicines, the clothing, the shelter. As I said before, everything is interconnected. Most of all, the love, kindness, and teaching that a mother gives to her child. Fundamental in Indigenous thoughts and worldview, Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota. And this was at, uh, I was at a, a lodge in, Tur in Saguin First Nation where I received this teaching. But it's really important when it comes to food. Traditional food is a cultural anchor, often important to the identity of Aboriginal people, and this was from 2015. The sharing of traditional food has a role in maintenance of social norms and expectations. There are important spiritual aspects associated with traditional food use. We might recognize this in our own location, but we are definitely not recognizing it when we're setting up policies in Indigenous communities. We think that we can rely upon our colonial systems, and it is created a healthcare epidemic from an indigenous perspective. But if we under, look at this report, and this was a report tabled by the Fox Lake Cree Nation in answer to the, the Kiosk Hydro Dam project. They were saying, if you wipe out our food, you're not just wiping out food, you're wiping us out. So health effects of colonial food systems, this is a bunch of data points that I think are important to share. It's estimated that eight, eight in 10 First Nation young adults will develop type two diabetes compared to five in 10 in the general population. Something is obviously wrong. I don't have to go into details there. The data speaks for itself. When we talk about reduced bush activity in places like Northern Quebec, Northern Manitoba, Northern BC, we talk about large, from high, large scale hydroelectric, we can talk about pipeline, we can talk about oil. These are all things that we do not do a very good job of exploring when we do impact benefit assessments. Um, and we don't do a very good job of understanding the, the role that taking away land, connections to the land, taking away activities on the land creates for many indigenous people. But it's very sad to say that we are talking about suicide, which is a dramatic effect of land loss culture loss um, in Northern Quebec, because that's where Carol de Bien was writing about. Some other stats are First Nations are five to six times more likely to die by suicide than their non-Indigenous counterparts, 11 times the national average. I just will sit with that for a second. In some communities, it's, it's much worse than that particular average. Claims of epigenetic changes to endocrine and immune disorders, rates of opioid addiction, substance abuse, chronic PTSD. And this is something that I thought was pretty profound. When I looked at the Cancer Care Ontario 2018 report, they recognized what colonialism has done um, in terms of cancer and mortality rates and also access to cancer care. In EUHD, which is Northern Quebec, life expectancy is 4.3 years less than in the rest of the province. So we have people in Northern Quebec who are going to live 4.3 years less than people in Southern Quebec. That's, that's just shocking to me. And how we can create policies or how we can 
support policies to make a difference because this is not something that is going away in the near future and it's something that we took a long time to create but it's something that we can support building new pathways to having a support system in terms of food so like uh, like danielle i want to point out some positives in terms of changes that i've seen and recognize them for what they are because these are important food movements to establish Mino Pimatuism in certain communities that I've been in and grateful to have seen them. But these communities are not always 100% um, on the right, uh, not on the right track, on, on, a, on the track to their own health, but they are moving towards that without, without a lot of support from us in Southern Canada. So I just pulled up this, this was a slide and my students would probably recognize this. When we talk about sustainable development, I mean, the only sustainable development that I recognize as sustainable is how Indigenous people treat their food. We talk about food loss and about a third of our food gets thrown out. If we talk about how many Indigenous nations, and this is from the Lakota perspective, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, this is, they used every single part of the animal. They ate everything and they used everything. I cannot think of a sustainable system as described to me in my first year by both Dr. John Devlin and Dr. Al Lozon. This is a sustainable system. There are no inputs, outputs, it's just closed. And I think that's important to recognize the loss that we have incurred in not recognizing this effort or not recognizing this story. In Opipan Napewin, South Indian Lake in northern, northern Manitoba, they are working on a recipe for food change, reclamation of indigenous food sovereignty. This is a program they started. It's an on the land program. And I have my, my wonderfully good friend, Vanessa Tate, who comes from Opipan Napewin. Um, and she sent me a picture and she said, this is a picture of my nephews learning how to skin a moose. These kids could probably survive in the bush. They have knowledge of the land. This is talking about an unforgetting movement and restoring. When we talk about Northern Quebec, UHT, which is my adopted home, I hope, um, we talk about some of the devastating effects of the land change there. Um, and these are in the words of the Cree, economically, socially devastated by large hydroelectric developments, initiated and built by our traditional lands by state-owned electricity corporations, Hydro-Quebec, we can see the devastation. If we think, talk about grandfathers, we can imagine the number of grandfathers displaced through this, this action. But then we go and see how people choose to have their own food, mino pimatuism. There was a shot of goose and shopai boiled bannock. There's a shot of a moose from my friend Minnie's. She used to keep a moose on her counter and we would go for lunch every day and she'd cut up part and stir fry it and give it to me. She did not want to go to the store. And there, was a, there were two stores in town. Um, and then we see uh, rabbit, rabbit stew in the bottom left-hand side. UNDRIP actually informs food policy when we think about it because it provides the right to practice and revitalize cultural traditions and customs. And if that's the case, we haven't done a good job of recognizing UNDRIP. I think I'll leave that aside for the moment, but you can see the other side of that, um, that spillway in this picture. It looks beautiful. It really would cause you to cry if you knew the devastation. And there are Cree elders that are buried under the floodway. And that's not something you can go and visit and, and walk away from without some scarring. Up in Nyad, which is in Nunavut, 50% of the food comes from self-produced on the land food, seal, carbu, Arctic char. That's a, um, an ushuk. It's not the typical one you see. Just for a lesson, there are many, many different types of markers on the land in the north. It's not just the traditional one that you see. Some mark all kinds of different things. There are markers on the land, and I think it's important that I could pass that knowledge along. But 50% of their food comes from that. It doesn't have, there's no internet or there's no um, cell phone service in Nyat. Um, and there's, a, a, according to the people that I talked there, it's the lowest crime um, 
lowest crime community up in Nunavut. From Yupik, which is in Alaska, they have a huge fishery where they employ like um, 29 communities where they, they pack row, they pack, um, they pack their salmon and they sell it in England. But they also make sure to go out and, and smoke and, and carry enough fish for the season before they do any of that. So this is a case where they're supporting both their own food sovereignty and also supporting themselves economically. And the Kungasovic that you see in the middle is a suicide prevention toolkit because the Yupik communities are, are five times or the reported rate of suicide of southern communities in the southern U.S. And 60% of those suicides are between 10 and 19 years old. So they, were, they came up with a response that emerged from the community that is also supported by economic development, which is supported by food sovereignty or food mean open Marxism. Finally, Gwich'in perspective and Old Crow. Communities need to develop their own food strategy which are relevant in power and lead to action to be more food secure. This came from a recent uh, webinar from, um, on climate change. You see in that picture caribou head soup, caribou and porcupine, which is by far my favorite um, food so far, but there's a lot of bones. And you see elders and youth um, cutting up or stripping off the skin from a caribou um, and then butchering it. These are things that people do because this is where their spirituality is based in. And we need to find ways how we can support that. And we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about that as I move forward here. Finally, the teaching from OG Cree and Anishinaabe perspective and the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. When we talk about food, we don't have the same conversation that most of us, most indigenous people, most traditional indigenous people have. They talk about the teaching that can be had by planting, harvesting, um, drying, taking care of wild rice, manamun. It's a, such a spiritual connection that they develop. And without having this, without allowing these, without allowing these things to grow and foster and blossom in communities, we are, we are not doing a very good job of having a pan-Canadian food policy that recognizes the food sovereignty of all of us. We don't have to think about where we get our food. We go to a grocery store. We're talking about Western science. We're talking about the Arctic traditional food systems. Um, is, 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 oh, I gotta move this because I can't read it. It's superior to the, that of the composite of market food consumed in the North. They're healthier when they eat traditional food. They want their own food choice, that's their choice, but it, it is scientifically researched that northern food keeps northern people healthier. And when we're importing a colonial system through stores like the Northwest Store, which dominate the market scene up there, there is no health that is provided to them. If they want that, if people want that in Nyat, that's their own choice, although there's only a co-op in Nyat, which is, well, I'm not sure, I have to, I've got to check that. But it's, that's where food choices um, become important and supportive on the land. Food movements are incredibly important in indigenous um, locations and in particular Inuit. Food is a recognition of sovereignty because I frame this differently. I'm looking to food to, to underpin sovereignty, not, to, not to, for sovereignty on its own right. Consuming traditional food revitalizes our culture, our language, and our ceremonies. It reinforces our sovereignty within our families. Many northern um, nations believe in they are autonomous because of all the history that exists between Canada and the First Nations that it was given to them, and they run their communities as if they're autonomous. But we need to support those movements, and we need to support food movements that underpin sovereignty. And this is a slide you've seen already. Danielle talked about it. I'm just going to pull it up because it definitely has impact on northern communities. I said to Danielle, they could have gone into one community with 25,000 people and pulled all the numbers there and so that the information needs to be more transparent in the What We Heard report. And I underline Indigenous given the great contributions and Indigenous communities here to reinforce some policy changes that are meaningful. So in terms of policy, we can do a little bit 
with a little bit of stuff that can help indigenous communities reestablish their own sovereign food sovereignty and food minopomatism. We can develop local community food guides in communities because if we talk about the Anishinaabe Asking Nation, Fort Severn is different than Ireland and their food, their food needs and food, what makes them healthy is very different. So we need to enforce a community Health Canada blended food guideline in those communities that they can take as their own and recognize those as having the ability to inform people in a good way. The second one is address food related deficits in current food policy. We have documents that we can use and we've recognized some of which we haven't recognized, but we have the truth and reconciliation. We have UNDRIP and we have tri uh, government agreements that could help underpin the food sovereignty, um, Mino Pimatuism. I just brought up a couple more slides that don't have long to go, but when we talk about Northwest Company and the way they approach, and Northwest is the predominant food retailer in the North, um, when they say that they, you know, to undertook a, 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 an exhaustive, intense um, project to translate, into 30 different dialects, that's, that's wonderful, but that doesn't address any sort of food sovereignty. And I have prices down there, and this is from 2014. These are prices that you run into in locations across Northern Canada, be it First Nations or Inuit communities. These are things that I'm sure people have seen before, but these are things that are impacting food health. If you want to choose spaghetti, it's a difficult decision because it costs you $19 to get spaghetti. I wanted to sort of, sort of end on some positive notes. So Old Crow, they threw out on the upper right-hand corner is the old Northwest store that was there for many, many years, allowed to fall apart. Old Crow made a decision in council to bring in Arctic Co-op. It was a first non, uh, non, it was their first non First Nations community. It was their first in uh, community in the Arctic. And they chose to do it because they recognized that their food choices were not being agreed to, understood, or the concept of the dollars that went into the community were not being coming into the community. They were going into North, Northwest and they would leave Northwest. So they took it upon themselves to establish a co-op. So this might be a, a form of food sovereignty movement. We need to do a policy reset. We have to do it locally defined based on indigenous ways of knowing and being. This is what I heard. This is not my concepts. We need to reinforce and protect the sacred relationship that indigenous food holds within indigenous communities. And that is underscored if you've ever been to a feast in a community. As I said, it's all part of a, a, a larger circle, health, food, economics, and everything else in life. And we have to do it in a way that recognizes indigenous laws and indigenous sovereignty. And I think short of that will be, we're creating a false measures, false paternalistic narratives and decades of colonial agenda, and we will end up no further along, but our communities, our indigenous communities will take that action on their own. And we need to be part of that action. The final reflection, some shots, we need, if we're talking about reconciliation, it's as my elder told me, or one of my elders told me, we can't even have reconciliation with that. We don't, we're not even at conciliation. But if we do this movement, we can help to create forms and pathways to reconciliation. And we have to ensure that it is honorable. Miigwech, Shekasani, Masicho, Koyaname. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Danielle and Stephen, for sharing that information with us. It was very informative. So for those in the audience, if you have any questions, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So I would just ask that you put your questions in there. That way they can get asked. Um, I did have one question come up in the chat. It was from Brian. Um, so his question is, how do we move forward in local food sovereignty without recognizing and repeating how the land slash water provided for needs and how indigenous people survived? Are these concepts reflected in the principles? 
Um, I, I think Brian sent that question. I, I'm, I'm going to take that one, Danielle. Sorry. Um, Brian sent that question before I started my presentation, and hopefully he saw the emphasis on recognizing Indigenous law and recognizing Indigenous sovereignty. We can't move forward without those two things. And time, and time is a construct that is not usually accepted by Western science or science principles. And obviously in the What We Heard report, Daniel and I talked about it, you know, consulting over a summer, doing it quickly, doesn't always engage in the people that we need to engage with and not going to those communities and doing consultation doesn't recognize their own sovereignty and, 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 and their own legitimate participation in their food sovereignty through Mino Pimatism. So there is another question, I believe. Um, how is First Mile and whole community and breaking down the silos created within the colonial capitalist and corporate agenda? Danielle? I don't, I don't know, but I'm <laughs> interested. <laughs> I'm going to have to look at firstmile.ca. I'm writing it down right now. Thank you for sharing that, Brian. Uh, from my perspective, it, it is, uh, I think I'm not, I haven't looked at First Mile. I believe that we all, getting informed is the first step for all of us, not only us in the, the presentation, but us as a, as a larger community. And once we're informed, we can start being more activists in terms of where to apply pressure in terms of policy direction. Policy people don't listen to anything unless there's a large movement um, against or for what they're saying. So that may be the, the, the way to create colonial, against colonial capitalist and corporate agenda. We have a ton of power and we need to express those power. And that's the stories that I was trying to say from those communities. They're not waiting around for us to form these policies. They're forming their own policies and taking action where they see that they need to do something different. And I, I, I can't speak to, to First Mile specifically because I, I don't know enough about it, but I will look into it more because it, it sounds like there is great alignment. I, my first reaction in, in terms of how you break down those silos is, is just continuing to press for transparency in all processes. And, and I think creating that accountability, like it, it's like we're, we're getting there. I, I see when you look at it historically, I see the progress. It's slower than that is right, but it's, it is progress. It's, it's just still inadequate at really capturing um, like the power dynamics that, that exist. And, and when I go and look and, you know, you're thinking of a question like, well, who presented to parliament? Like which industry interests presented to parliament? I want to know who presented at what time and who was in the audience. You can usually find those things out, but nobody makes it easy for you to find it. Like I had to go into the federal, like parliament presentations to find the agendas for that part. It's not pulled together for the community to see who's presenting from industry. So there's lots of room to make, to push for transparency in a way that's accessible for people. And that's one, one step. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Just getting back to Brian's, just while I have a minute, Brian, it was said last week I was at the Canadian Food Law Policy Conference, which was very Western and uh, legalistic with lots of lawyers. And part of, the, part of the group that was there said, you know, just the fact that we're here having these discussions will move things forward. And I, I think that's, that, that, that gives me a certain amount of hope. <laughs> Alrighty, so we have another question here. Uh, Corn Cornelia, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, what goes into making uh, Benok? Uh, are these grasses with seeds that could make the um, flower, or is it another adaptation to colonism, like um, fry bread? Yeah, my understanding, and I, I have no. I, I make my own bannock. Bannock is uh, is a form of um, Scum. It's just something you make up fast and you can fry it or you can put it in the oven, but it's really, it's made with flour. I've never seen a recipe for bannock with, uh, with, with manamon, with wild rice. It, it, it might be good, but I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a chef. I wish I was. 
Good question. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I believe these are all our questions. Um, Stephen, Danielle, do you guys have anything to add? No, this thank, thank you for giving us the forum to, to speak today. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there's one more question I just noticed. Just okay. Um, yeah, it's from Jean. Uh, when is the new food guy coming out? Any day. <laughs> <laughs> like the a food a food policy for Canada, it, it was expected by now, I think, um, and they say later this year. So. Okay. Um, so I would like to thank you, Stephen and Danielle, uh, both of you for your great presentation, and as well as the audience for attending um, and for their participation. Have a great rest of the day, everybody, and thank you for participating. Oh, yeah, thank you for having us, and thank you to all the virtual participants, too. Glitch, thank you. Bye.